Welcome to the third episode in our series of podcasts on satire for the London Review of Books. I'm Claire Bucknell, I'm a fellow of All Souls Oxford, and I'm joined again by Colin Burrow. Hello. Also a fellow of All Souls. Um, And today, Colin, we are being exceptionally brave and venturing forward into the 17th century. Scary terrain. There be dragons. Um, and we, we left satire in a bad way at the end of our last episode. Elizabethan satire seemed to have so much promise. It was both a, um, a shaggy, wild, woodland creature and a, and a jumbled plate of goodies. There was so much rudeness in it. It was all great. And then you banned it. Or oh, it was banned <laughs> and burned by the Archbishop of Canterbury, which was performed memorably by Claire Bucknell uh, in June 1599. I did do that. Um, uh, so basically all we've got left to talk about is a steaming pile of burnt books. Yep, absolutely. But we've got to remember that satire is a kind of phoenix that rises always from the ashes. And I suppose what happened at the beginning of the 17th century is that satire more or less migrated to the stage So John Marston, Ben Jonson, and even Shakespeare actually all wrote satirical dramas, which picked up on a lot of the preoccupations and the tricks of the printed verse satires, which the bishops had burnt only a few months before or a couple of years before. So you get cuckolds, you get wives of merchants desperate to get off with courtiers, you get old fools, none of those present, (laughs) and spry young sons, courtiers who sell all their fields to buy suits, corrupt lawyers, the whole gamut of filthy, extreme stuff that had figured in verse satire gets onto the stage. And you also get, of course, vigorous mutual abuse exchanged among satirical dramatists. Okay, and today we'll be talking about Ben Jonson, of whom all that was particularly true, wasn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, well, introduce us to Jonson. How does he fit into the bigger story we're telling about English satire? And how does the play we're going to talk about today, Volpone of 1606, fit into that story? Well, um, I suppose the first thing I should do is explain a bit about Johnson's historical reputation. And the second thing I might do is explain why I think that reputation is more or less entirely false. Very bold start, but go on. Yeah, well, OK, the uh, the reputation. So by the second decade of the 17th century, Johnson had in effect made a reputation for himself, which persisted at least into the last century among critics, at least, Uh, And according to this, he is basically the big, fat, solid, classical alternative to Shakespeare. And Shakespeare warbles his native wood notes wild. And Johnson follows classical rules, creates dramas that follow the principles which literary critics were extracting from Roman comedy, which came to be called the unities of time, place and persons. And Johnson, so the story goes, was also vitally interested and Shakespeare wasn't, which is, I think, not true, in having his plays and poems published. So in 1616, Ben Jonson published a folio, which is to say just a big expensive volume, of his own works, as he called them. And 1616, at this point, he's still alive. Yep. Um, he, he carried on, <laughs> despite several strokes, until right into the reign of Charles I, not long before the Civil War. He dies in 1637, whereas Shakespeare dies the year that Jonson publishes that works in 1616. And we should note that hardly any living author had published a volume called Works until that time. Absolutely. Uh, and, and those who did so wouldn't have included plays among their works in the way Johnson did, as well as poems. I mean, so people would publish volumes called Works, which included poems. But making plays for the popular stage into something you call Works was totally Johnson. So that was a big statement. And... The folio of Shakespeare's comedies, histories and tragedies, so that doesn't include poems at all, uh, wasn't published until seven years later, in 1623, well after Shakespeare's death. And in some respects, that volume was an imitation of Johnson's great big uh, statement of 1616. And of course, the Shakespeare first folio wasn't put together by Shakespeare, it was put together by uh, uh, a couple of actors called um, Hemmings and Condell, whom we will meet actually later in this podcast, I think. Yes, we will. Um, Okay, so that's Johnson's reputation. What do you think, Colin Burrow, that view gets wrong? (laughs) Well, the key thing to remember about Johnson is that he was, probably more than anybody else in this period, actually, or any author in this period, a self-invention. 
So he deliberately set about constructing an image for himself through the 1616 folio. And I have a copy of the folio sitting here on my desk, although unfortunately it's only the uh, second folio of 1640, which reprints the first. Um, and the thing that he did was to put right at the start of the volume uh, a work that made him look like the great classical reformer of the English stage. So we open the 1616 folio and the thing, first thing we see is a massively ornate title page um, bearing a whole load of representations of, of, of allegorical figures called things like comedy and tragedy. But if you look Claire, at the top left of the page, we'll do some realistic crinkling of 400 year old paper. I mean, to, it's seriously so, real paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so what you see at the top left is a figure of a satyr who is labelled satyr in case you didn't get it with uh, what looks like a tree coming out of his head and a sort of giant phallus staff thing um, and because he's at the top left if you read the page as you do from left to right and top to bottom satyr is the first thing you see above comedy and tragedy so it's sort of saying i begin with satyr and if you follow on from the um uh title page there are, there are pages of dedications by uh, very famous uh, to, to very famous people of Johnson's works and ded dedicatory poems by Johnson's friends which is usual sort of thing but if you go to the first bit of actual Ben Johnson in the volume it starts with the prologue to every man uh, in in his humor okay well that that makes sense that that play was performed in 1598 that's the beginning of Johnson's career as a playwright so begin at the beginning right yeah yeah I mean I'm all in favor of beginning at the beginning but but and every man in his humor was an early play but it actually wasn't Johnson's first um, and it was also a play which Johnson revised probably for publication in the folio and it's pretty certain that he added the prologue to it probably for the folio and the, the prologue basically says to the world, I'm better than Shakespeare and I understand all the rules which underlie classical dramas. And unlike him and unlike pretty much everyone else whom I won't deign to name, I won't write history plays in which in the tiring house bring wounds to scars and I won't fight over York and Lancaster's long jars and so on. Which is a reference to the Wars of the Roses about which Shakespeare had, of course, composed the Henry VI plays. And the problem, it was believed, with trying to dramatise the events of long historical periods like that one um, was this idea that we touched on earlier about classical drama and the restriction of the unity of time, which is about restricting your action to a 24-hour period on stage. Yeah, and and the Henry's, Henry VI plays, of course, cover about half a century, which is several 24-hour periods. Shall we, shall we agree on that? I, I believe, I believe I, it is. I can't yeah. do the maths. Yeah. But, yeah, so Johnson starts out the folio implying that Shakespeare and the rest are inherently unruly and unclassical. And in some ways, the cruelest thing about that is that Shakespeare actually acted in Every Man in His Humour. And he figures in the cast list, which in the second folio is directly facing this prologue, which is giving the bird to Shakespeare. You know, there is his name as one of the principal comedians. Um, so Johnson is really standing up against the world uh, from the very first moment of the first folio. And he says that he will write of deeds and language such as men do use and persons such as comedy would choose when she would show an image of the times and sport with human follies, not with crimes. Which means, in effect, that he's saying he's going to be doing satire. Yeah, so he begins with satire. And the, and the very tangled plot of every man in his humour is basically a romp through the absurdities of London li life of a kind that is very, very like the satires of the 1590s. So, you know, you've got a top dressing of classical comedy uh, with an old father spying on his son, but you've got young wags about town and a catalogue of satirical London types sort of frolicking around smoking tobacco and doing various Elizabethan things like that. And then the second play in the folio, no prizes for guessing which, um, is Every Man Out of His Humour. And this one is dedicated in the folio to the Inns of Court. Um, and that was that key milieu, as we saw in the last episode, for the composition of verse satires, John Donne, Marston, etc. Yep. And actually more than that, because on the title page of Every Man Out 
it is described as ta-da, a comical satire. There it is. Yeah. So he, he is producing these uh, satirical dramas immediately in the aftermath of the ban, because Every Man Out of His Humour was first published uh, in 1600, while Marston satires were still smouldering on the Bishop's bonfire, or Claire Bucknell's bonfire, um, uh, you know, that had started burning in June 1599. Okay, I see where we're going with this. So what you're arguing is that Johnson's latter-day reputation as this um, austere neoclassical dramatist was a kind of retrospective construction that he built for himself through the way in which he presented his works in this big folio of 1616. Yeah, but I'm also saying something else, that, that Johnson sort of dressed himself up as a classical dramatist and for centuries literary critics more or less swallowed that self-representation whole without questioning it. Uh, as they should have done. And Johnson at heart was also a very different kind of dramatist who was completely immersed in the sort of scuzzy and volatile and unruly energies of late Elizabethan London. So he was reading and absorbing popular pamphlets about crooks and, and what were called in the slang of the time coney catchers or urban thieves who preyed on gullible countrymen. And they are basically the substance of his plots. And that is also, of course, the, the, the world that fed the Elizabethan satirists. Yeah, yeah, the stinky, stinky, grimy London that they they fed on, really. And, you know, I, we have very refined critical nostrils, don't we? We do. I'll sniff to illustrate their fineness. And, and, and our nostrils are trained to distinguish between the stink and corruption of the city and the desiccated flavours of neoclassical criticism. They're, they're sort of different. But but in Johnson, they are absolutely convergent. And I think that's the most important single thing to grasp about him. Thanks for listening to this extract from On Satire, a close reading series from the London Review of Books. To listen to the full episode and all our other close reading series, sign up to our close reading subscription at lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.